Joining us this morning is Dean Kamen, founder of FIRST and the president of DECA Research and Development. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for inviting me. Well, you just wrapped up a very important speech. How do you feel it went? I'm hoping, and from the feedback I've gotten, I'm somewhat convinced that I have some people very receptive to the ideas uh, we presented today. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of those ideas that you presented? What I presented was, hey, I'm a technology guy, not a physician, certainly not somebody that's directly delivering cl clinical care to patients, but I said, we've spent the last decade working on a machine that would allow hemodialysis to be done safely by a patient self-administering the therapy, for instance, in their bedroom, okay. alone, at home. Um, I've spent 20 years building peritoneal dialysis machines for our partner, Baxter Healthcare, and this was an enormous success. But unfortunately, there's a relatively small segment of the population of people with end-stage renal failure that uh, can make use of peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis has the potential to help a lot more people, but it has a higher threshold of work you have to do to make it something that could be safely done by yourself at home. And we, for instance, spent 10 years figuring out how to make it much simpler to set up. We put safety systems that will ensure that you're uh, protected even if you're alone and sleeping. We made the, the, the cassettes that deal with the blood side and the dialysate side of the system uh, easier to be practical in a home. For instance, the machine makes its own sterile water out of tap water in your house. So we developed this, but we realized it will remain a science fair project unless the community of, of care providers, the clinicians, the people that do at CMS, that do the ability to uh, create the right incentives commercially, to give it the right uh, support. We need the Food and Drug Administration to give it the right approvals. So I'm here saying, hey, we've done our part. We did the engineering. Um, we're hoping that the entire community of people that, that give care, that take care of patients, that write policy, that handle insurance, that handle everything, education, will embrace this new and we think much better technology to give patients a much better quality of life and reduce the cost. Well, it sounds win-win for all of those involved. What's the biggest obstacle when it comes to getting the, this new technology into the homes of patients? The biggest obstacle I've seen in every project we've ever done is if it's incrementally better than what's out there, people adopt it. Anytime you show somebody a really big opportunity that's not incremental, the forces of human nature are conservative. What's required is the invention works, but then the people that have the courage and the vision and the resources and the authority to implement what else is required to turn that invention from a science fair project into something that's helping a lot of people. That's what I'm hoping we presented as an opportunity or as a challenge to that room full of people because you're seeing the thought leaders and all the leaders in the world that are uh, taking care of people that uh, have no renal function. And if they can collectively say, this new technology can be the next step that improves the quality of life and, and again, helps uh, reduce cost. Uh, we've got to find a way to implement it. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, that there is the vision and the courage in that room to do that. Just got to get past the apprehension a little bit. What would you say the uh, reaction has been thus far? Well, I think there were some very earnest statements that I was hearing from people saying, we agree with you that the current state of how we uh, treat these patients is really unacceptable. And they all said, yeah, we didn't have a piece of technology uh, that we could use to, to help facilitate getting more pe patients home, to allow them to do their own therapy, to have a better quality of life, to have more personal dignity. And so a lot of people seem to say, we agree with you, and if you deliver that technology, we'll help make it part of standard of care. So a little, a little optimism there, that's great. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what you're doing in getting children involved in technology, specifically women involved in STEM. Nearly three decades ago, I started a not-for-profit organization called FIRST, and it sounds like a sporting thing. I never saw kids running around a sporting event cheering. I want to be second. So I said, well, they love sports. They love entertainment. I'm going to create an entertaining sport in which kids are going to use robots as an excuse to learning about technology. And this program now grew from 20 or 30 
schools adopting it as an after school, one season a year sport. This year, we had 72,000 schools, 200,000 volunteer mentors from the technology world there to show the kids how cool tech can be. A lot of them are young women. And so whenever I get the opportunity to stand on a stage like that in a room full of low hanging fruit, all these technologists, these physicians, these clinicians, these researchers, these professors, and say to them, look, get involved with creating the next generation of scientists and engineers, help first. And I delivered that message. And again, a lot of the people here said, give me some information. I want to get involved with first. So I think that helped. Awesome. Well, congratulations on a successful speech. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much for uh, sharing your time with us this morning. Thank, Thank you. you.